The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. This Australian Investors Podcast episode is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, use the coupon code RASK and secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. We're proud to have the Intelligent Investor as an ongoing supporter of the Australian Investors podcast. As a result, RASK does not earn a volume-based fee. Simply head to intelligentinvestor.com.au or use the link in your podcast player to access your free trial. This episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is also proudly supported by SelfWealth, Australia's leading independent broker. Over 120,000 investors trust SelfWealth with over $9 billion in equities. With SelfWealth, you can trade ASX, US, and Hong Kong listed shares for a flat fee. On a $10,000 investment with Comsec, you'd pay $29.95 in fees. Yet with SelfWealth, it's just $9.50. The thing I like about SelfWealth is the full access to fundamental company data and how easy it is to trade US, Hong Kong, and Aussie shares in one place. You can see your Apple shares and ACDC ETF right beside each other. To join SelfWealth now, use the link in your podcast player or head to selfwealth.com.au and use the coupon code RASK during sign-up. Thanks for tuning in to today's podcast. Please remember that all of the information in this podcast episode is limited to general information only. That means the information is not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So you should seek the advice of a licensed and trusted financial professional before acting on the information. And before you acquire or apply for a financial product, please read the PDS or product disclosure statement, which should be available on the issuer's website. Lastly, please keep in mind that past performance is not indicative of future performance. Kanish, thanks for joining me for this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast. No, thank you for having me on. Yeah, it's great to be able to chat. Uh, ETFs, thematic ETFs in particular, or sector-specific ETFs. Um, today, we're talking about the Robo ETF, so ro- Robotics and Automation, which has this kind of flair with AI, which is really cool. And we're going to talk about kind of the sector at large, the use cases, and just drill into like how it's actually constructed. Because most Australian investors don't really have exposure to this sector from the outset. You know, if they're looking on just on the ASX, um, this is a pretty tricky one to get exposure to. We have companies like Altium in Australia, which does printed circuit boards. Um, we have a few of the general tech companies. And then we have some of the larger companies that utilize technology, but not specifically in robotics and automation. So it's kind of an interesting conversation. Maybe just to start things off, mate. Let's just set the scene. Like, what are we talking about? Like, what's included in robotics and automation and AI? Like, how do those things come together? I've got an example of a company at the end, but um, just from your perspective, like, why is this? Why does this product exist? Why does the industry exist? What problems are being solved? Let's just go from there. Yeah, definitely. So it, it's it's a funny one. So if you were to say, what is a robotics or an automation or an AI company, an artificial intelligence company, your mind immediately would go, okay, it's a tech play. It's going to be a technology stock. It's going to be things like Facebook, Google, Apple, Microsoft, Oracle, etc. That's actually not the space where majority of the innovation is happening from a robotics perspective or an automation or an AI perspective. Yes, there are some tech companies in this, but from where we stand as a mega trend of robotics and automation and artificial intelligence, it's not a tech play. 
So we have partnered with a company called Robo Global, and to be honest, they're probably the, the premier experts in this particular trend. They actually created the very first index to track this mega trend. So that was back in 2013. So if you cast your mind back to then, majority of robotic companies would be in the manufacturing space, and it's basically the big robots that you see in factories that put together cars and you know, that we have in the factories that put together sort of the, the processing plants. That's how we think of robots. But there's a lot as technology is advanced as the speed in um, semiconductors and chips, et cetera, as the internet has innovated, the use of robotics and automation and AI has increased. So you're now finding that you've got companies in healthcare, in consumer, in food and agriculture that are classified or could be seen as participating in the trend, in the mega trend of robotics and automation and AI. But that's where we wanted to partner up with, with a company like Robo Global when we launched the Robo ETF here in Australia back in 2017, because we wanted to have a pure play. We didn't want just there to be, there was no classification. So I guess to, to think of this, when a stock is listed, there are companies that classify those stocks based on which sector which industry they're a part of. There is no industry of robotics. There is no industry of automation. There is no industry of AI. There is no sector. So how do you then work out how to get exposed to the theme? And as you said, there are some names in Australia, very few, but we've got names in this particular, in the portfolio, things like Ocado or Yaskawa, uh, which is a manufacturing robotics play, um, or iRobot. They do vacuum cleaners. Um, John Deere, tractor company, very big in the autonomous um, vehicle space and sort of autonomous sensing. So again, you wouldn't assume there to be these companies, but there's a, a bigger play and that's why we wanted to partner up with an expert in the field. Mm. It's an interesting industry in overall because like you said, trying to bring robotics, automation and AI, AI into one portfolio is, is kind of for a growth investor that might seem like the dream because you effectively have these three things, which are a bit buzzwordy of course, but you have companies in this sector that are really driving their respective industries forward. So, you know, whether it's healthcare, whether it's just a humble vacuum cleaner, so many people have those vacuum cleaners. I was chatting to my neighbor the other day and he, he just bought a house and he's like, I'm not going to get another vacuum. I'm just going to get the robotic vacuum and then get a cleaner to come in every now and again or have the, the little Dyson to run around. And uh, these types of little, I guess, automations uh, appearing everywhere. So not just in the home, not just in the Amazon factories where shelves are moving and packing, you know, everything from companies that create systems like iRobot also, even though it creates vacuums, it also creates systems for defense and for like, you know, those, um, I don't know what you'd call them, but like the bomb kind of like protection of robots that go in first and, and try and disarm the bomb, um, make it safe before a human comes in. Like these types of tools are, are really cool too. Just on that, you, you mentioned Amazon and you mentioned the Amazon Robotics. So that's a really interesting play because Amazon Robotics, yes, they're probably the one of the largest companies that have from a robotics perspective, but we actually don't have Amazon in this portfolio. It's 85 stocks at the moment. No, Amazon, because they don't generate revenue from their robotic center or that arm. So, you know, when you're wanting to get exposure to the trend, you want to get exposure to people that are generating revenue from it and innovating in it, not just simply buying a company and then using it, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. Because if you want to benefit from, I guess, the overall structural trend, the easiest use case or the easiest way to kind of follow what's actually happening with that you know, thematic is actually to follow the money, right? So yes, you know, you get exposure through Amazon, but you might get exposure to many other things um, that come with that, like e-commerce, which you might not want, or, you know, servers and cloud computing, which has been good in the past, but you might not want going forward. What was interesting is the robo score. So when I was learning about the robo ETF, most ETFs uh, and we're talking off air about this. Most ETFs, you know, have an index methodology, which is effectively, this is the sector, this is a classification, and this is the weighting methodology. And we put that together and that's the portfolio. Whereas this uses a robo score. I think I got that right, like a robo score. So out of 100, it scores the ETF. And it kind of relates back to what you were just saying about companies that actually generate revenue from robotics uh, and automation. So can you explain how that works? Because we see this in a couple of ETFs on the ASX, but not many. And I think this is something we're going to see more of, effectively automating a human input, so like an active management approach, but with the automation element of a traditional ETF. 
So it's kind of the best of both worlds. Can you explain how this works? Yeah, definitely. So the Robo Global team, if you th- think about it like this, so they have firstly a, a team of research, um, a director of research, they've got a team of research analysts. Now this research team is analyzing companies on a daily basis, meeting with companies that they've identified to truly understand where their place sits within the mega trend of robotics, automation, and artificial intelligence. So they're talking to these companies, analyzing their management team, talking to their clients, talking to their suppliers, really looking, doing the deep down, deep level research that you would normally get from an active manager. And they're wanting to understand from a revenue perspective, how much revenue and the purity of revenue that they're generating from this thing. Are they innovating in this area? So you may have a company that doesn't generate much revenue, but that's because they're yet to maybe set up a distribution center or they're yet to, they're still working on the sort of the innovation or the the products that they're trying to do their research and development. But they're really going deep down in that perspective of analyzing where these companies sit. You then have that idea of, okay, so they've identified these companies and that's well and good. But then from the research team perspective, they want to have some guidance in terms of which area of robotics, automation, AI should they be looking at. And that's where Robo Global were a bit innovative in this space. And they created what they call the dream team of the megatrend. And these are their strategic advisors. And the strategic advisors are entrepreneurs, academics, industry thought leaders in the space of robotics and automation and artificial intelligence. So it's people like uh, Dr. Daniela Rus. Now, she is the head of the Robotics Center at MIT. It's um, Dr. Henry Christensen. He's the director of UC San Diego in Contextual Robotics Institute. But then you've also got Raffaello D'Andrea, another PhD on their dream team. He was the founder and creator of Amazon, what is now called Amazon Robotics. It was called Kiva System. He sold it to Amazon. So these dream team are advising the Robo Global Research Team and saying, you should be considering 3D systems as an area to focus on. And so what they do is they help Robo Global create 11 subsectors in which they need to be looking at. So that's things like food and agriculture, 3D printing, healthcare, autonomous systems, manufacturing, and then on the sort of the, the application side or the technology side, so it's like integration, sensing, actuation. Um, so there's a company called Co Young Technologies and they're one of the leaders in 3D inspection systems on chips. So by they created this autonomous software and this AI software in the background to essentially allow them to pick out defects in chip manufacturing, reducing the chip defects, which means you've created efficiency. So if companies like Apple, then the, the chips that we have, Ko Young would have been part of that process. But to know that within 3D printing, for example, the advisors will be telling the Robo Global Research Team, 3D printing, it's an area to look at, but what part of 3D printing? Commercial, retail, and that's where the strategic advisors say focus on commercial, the research team then go out and find companies. And if they need to, they rely on that strategic advisory board to help them open doors with some of these companies. Because again, these are the experts in the field. So you've got this sort of essentially collective, you know, dream team squad, you could call it, on the robotics and automation and AI space. These are creating and analyzing companies on daily, day in, day out basis. So that's your active element. So they've created a universe and they've identified based on their scoring, they've created a score for each of these stocks within their universe of about a thousand companies. Now, as an index, how does it become an index? Well, there are index rules that are applied. So the companies have to be of a certain size. They've got to um, have certain liquidity. Um, they've got to be trading in certain markets. They've got to have a certain score. Those rules around the index are applied every quarter. So yes, during that quarter, there may be some changes on the research team's view, but they don't impact the index, which is why we can create an index around it. You know, as an investor, when the rules are applied, you know what those rules are. The creation of the universe is active, but the creation of the actual portfolio is passive. And that's sort of the the best of both worlds. It's the latest innovation is what in the in the index industry, and it means that we can. It's still a passive index, you know. As, as ETF securities, we simply track the index. We leave it to the experts of Robo Global to do the hard work and pick the portfolio. It's not our job to do that. We simply track that index, 
but it's not going to be changing on a daily basis. It changes every quarter as a rebounds. And to be honest, you don't see many changes coming in or out because you know there's not sort of big changes that the that the companies that the portfolio research team is seeing. And then the weighting of, of that portfolio is also an equal weighted methodology. So the big thing that Robo Global have said, which with any thematics, and you know, we can speak about thematic exposures, you know, and how to invest in thematics within a portfolio, but you don't want to invest in the biggest company or the smallest company. You don't want to invest in the winner or the loser. It's really hard to find the winner or loser, and especially in some of these areas where you don't know enough about it. You want to invest in the theme. The theme will win. So how do I get exposure to the theme? And that's through ETFs such as Robo. It's interesting, yeah. When we're investing uh, particularly in growth style companies, like here at Rask, we tend to focus on you know, an equal weighting approach as kind of the default because uh, like you said, oftentimes, at least with our members, they don't necessarily have hands-on experience with the research that we're doing. So we say, you know, by default, if you can just go to an equal weighting approach, that's probably the superior option because it gives you, you know, equal weighting exposure to everything. And then from there, you can understand, okay, you can get used to the, the industry, the sector, whatever. And then at least you have exposure to some of the companies that uh, could be winners. Of course, you're going to get some of those that might be losers, but they tend to fall out over time. So it's a really interesting one. And I, I think it's it's pretty unique in Australia because if you had, let's say you had those those analysts looking at robotics companies and the industry overall, uh, in an active fund, it would be a lot more expensive than through an ETF, which can kind of automate the backend processes um, and provide that exposure. You said that you know it doesn't really tend to turn over that much. Um, which is probably one criticism of thematic ETFs, right? Like t- high turnover from regular rebalancing or substantial changes to portfolios. And that's one of the reasons why we do quarterly rebalancing on, on this particular fund, just to allow for if there were to be changes, you don't want there to be large rebalances where particular companies may be quite large positions in the portfolio or if you leave it too long. Like if it, if the, if it was annual, the turnover would be a lot higher. And that's why we've sort of taken the approach on the quarterly rebalance. And also from an equal weight perspective as well, the, the allocations is 86 companies at the moment within the portfolio. So, you know, the maximum at one point in time that you may have exposure to within the portfolio at the time of the rebalance is going to be less than 2% anyway. During the quarter, yes, that weight may run above a certain point because of the price move. But it's not going to be significant enough where you have big sort of rebounds, um, sort of turnover risk. Mm, yeah, interesting. As I was going through the list of companies on your website that are actually in the fund right now, because you disclose the top 10 and then you've got all the holdings as well. I think it's in like an Excel sheet. I noticed that there was a company called Intuitive Surgical, which is a very popular company amongst growth investors because it's kind of like otherworldly in terms of what it can do. And just even looking at the machine, it's... It's a bit weird. It seems like there's arms flying off everywhere. Kind of the way I describe it is kind of look, looks kind of like a spider um, <laughs> that a doctor can sit inside or operate remotely, and it does surgeries. Right? I don't know if you know much about it. Yeah. So essentially, their main product is a machine called the Da Vinci machine. It helps doctors do mid body surgeries. Now, a doctor can control this machine from the same room, from the other, from another room in the hospital, or from the other side of the world, depending upon the internet connection. This is an example of an industry from a healthcare perspective where you had the use of robotic arms in manufacturing for many decades and they've improved you know, significantly even since from when they started getting used in the 70s and 80s. You've now got that sort of technology, but it's being applied within the healthcare sector. The use of and the speeds of the internet that we now have allow for use of these machines to be used with actual surgeries on humans. Not only does a Da Vinci machine help a doctor reduce their stammers or their shakes in a surgery, it learns from operations. So it's got built-in AI that's learning from each operation that's helping the doctor make decisions in surgeries. Now, that's great in itself. And um, I think you've, you've seen it, but on YouTube, if someone puts in Da Vinci machine plus grape, you can actually see it peel a grape and then stitch it back up together. So this is an idea of, you know, there's, there was a big sort of discussion around will machines, you know, ruin, you know, human employment? And, you know, are they going to be the death of us in terms of employment? Are we going to have sort of lines out the door in terms of unemployed? That's not the case. You know, this particular machine still requires a human behind it. It just helps achieve a better result for, for that patient. 
and that's all you want. The machines aren't cheap either. They're about $2 million US dollars each. And most large hospitals in the developed world anyway have exposure and have these machines in their hospitals. Mm. Yeah, I, I was looking at some numbers before and I think it's available in 67 countries now, the Da Vinci machine. And it, um, it's, I can't remember the exact number of uh, machines that are in the US. I think maybe 4,000 and maybe 2,000 outside the US. And what's interesting, I think, about it is that it assists in the automation of things. And I think that's when you're doing, when you're getting an apodectomy, for example, which is when you get your appendix removed, uh, which I had done two years ago, to know that there's a tool that can even kind of second guess and, and make sure that doctors are doing the right thing and reading the right things in terms of like what they're seeing inside the body when you're, when you're opened up. I think, you know, if there's anywhere in the world you want to kind of let robotics and a, and a superior solution come in, you should, you should do that uh, in medicine. So I thought that was really interesting. And um, what I, I think, I don't know if this is 100% accurate. I got this, I read some Morningstar, which was that the, I think it was like 1.3 million surgeries or something that the Da Vinci device assisted in. I, think, I don't know if that's a cumulative or year over year or something, but I just thought that was a huge number considering, you know, the number of surgeries each year. It's just growing in prevalence in terms of doctor, more and more doctors are using it. And I think one of the reasons for that is that surgeons are now being trained um, with these robotic um, assistants, if you like. And so when they're learning, they're learning to use the machines first before they go and do it themselves, which then means it's kind of natural. Like you see like Google and all the different um, technology companies recognize this early on. If you can train students and younger people and you know people in universities with your tools, they're going to opt for that in the future, which is a pretty powerful feedback loop. So yeah, I think from a f- fundamental investor's perspective, just on intuitive surgical, one last thing is that it looks like revenue slowed year over year a bit, but you know, when you consider the size, the addressable market for these products, I feel like it's like multiples bigger than it already is, even though it's been going for 15, 20 years, you know. So um, fascinating stuff. And it's interesting you m- mentioned about, you know, the concern people have around robotics, right? It's not just it's not just in healthcare. This is kind of like everywhere, right? So I think that's right. You know, we, we have seen this one, that the, the use of robotics and automation and AI, it's not just, as I said, you know, 30, 40 years ago, it was very much just in manufacturing, the big growth areas are going to be healthcare. It's going to be consumer. You, you mentioned iRobot. Consider the fact that you've got the um, the Roomba vacuum cleaner. That's their main product that iRobot sells. That particular vacuum cleaner uses artificial intelligence to not only map out an autonomous sort of, you know, the, the software and the technology that we have in autonomous vehicles, it's now applying that within their own vacuum cleaners to work out, you know, the the, social, the distancing between objects and navigating across different objects, but also remembering the messiest parts of the house. So, you know, I was speaking with a client and he was saying he's got a Roomba and his Roomba actually goes directly to where his toddler has food and has dinner and lunch and breakfast because that's the messiest part. So immediately, as soon as they set it off, it goes straight there. And that's the sort of thing that you're saying. So if a technology is being applied and created for the manufacturing or for autonomous vehicles, the application of that technology can be put into other areas. And food and agriculture is another one. If you know, someone were to say to me, John Deere is a robotics and automation company, an AI company, I would have laughed about five years ago, but it is. The you know, majority of the tractors that John Deere sells are autonomous um, driving, soft, using autonomous driving. It uses sensing within its, its, in its machinery. So, you know, if you've got... Um, sensing that can pick out which seeds need to be watered in a crop and what a pressure to apply from that water. That's what you actually want to start to see. So the efficiencies that you have, there is a need as well when you think about it from a perspective of just satisfying humans' demand for goods and services, whether it's the harvesting of crops, whether it's the mailing out of packages you know using the you know from a grocery perspective so Ocado is a UK company that Coles have a partnership with here in Australia so in all their aut- automated sort of supermarket centers that they've got that sort of the, the fulfillment centers that Coles have they use Ocado technology to basically create all the different packages that then get sent out to clients and consumers you won't be able to satisfy human demand without the use of robotics. 
and automation and artificial intelligence. So there'll be this idea that you're going to start to see a combination of both the use of robotics, but also alongside humans. You know, these are not the case. I think back in the day, it was, a, it was thought that, well, the robotics are going to replace the human or a human can never work alongside a robot because it's going to be dangerous. It's not the case anymore. Mm. Yeah, it's fascinating. Like, just hearing all those stories, like I order my groceries typically online from Coles each week. Um, it's just a huge saver in terms of my time, just clicking, what did you order last week? Uh, making slight tweaks and then it rocks up the next morning. Uh, so easy. That's not my pitch for Coles. It's just a pitch in general for automation, I guess, just being more productive with your time, right? Because then you can go and do other things. And like instead of vacuuming the house every second day, if you have a toddler, you can use the Roomba to run around, which is super valuable. Uh, again, because that just puts you to more productive use in society and in your life, which I think is kind of cool, not necessarily a negative. And it's funny, if you think about the fact that when, an, when the spreadsheets were first created or emails were first created, people thought, well, that's going to do away with certain roles. And it hasn't. It hasn't made our jobs. It hasn't made the fact that we work three days a week. And we probably, if we get, you know, you, there are, we made, it's made our jobs easier using spreadsheets, using, using Microsoft Excel or using emails, but it hasn't completely done away with other, with, with our, with, with employment. You know, there's created other jobs associated with it. Yeah. And I think that's a big thing too. I think there's a great uh, movie on Netflix, which talks about the computers at NASA in the sixties that were replaced by the Intel machine. Um, when they're trying to put rockets into space. And it was kind of fascinating how all of a sudden it came along and they're worried about their, their jobs. Uh, in, this, in this particular story, they all learned to program the machine instead of crunching the numbers themselves. They learned to, to become, and they become programmers, which as we know, is a pretty valuable switch in, t- in terms of your career path um, then and now. So that's really interesting, mate. And I, okay, so just to tie this off then, Global Robotics and Automation ETF, it's under... Ticket code R-O-B-O, Robo, which is pretty straightforward for people that are interested. I'd encourage you to go and have a look at the website. Like if you're an individual stock picker, even go and have a look because, you know, I, I think it's a great source of ideas. Like just seeing that intuitive surgical is in there and there's these experts, it can be a short list for you if, if you choose to use that as kind of a, your, one part of your filter. And I think for us, you can either take the basket, you can take the basket and some others, or you can just take, you know, you can use it just as short list. So that's all available on the ETF security site, right? Yeah, it's all available on um, etfsecurities.com.au. Um, just go into products and you can click Robo. I think just for people that sometimes get a bit of sort of uncertainty or how to use this in a portfolio, this is a purely global play. You know, you, you, if, you're, if you were to look at it, it's not just got exposure to just US stocks. Yes, it's got exposure to US companies, but it's also got exposure to Japan, Europe, um, no Australian names at the moment, um, but it's all looking at developed markets. It's a purely global exposure. Um, it goes across sectors. You know, we've, we've talked about some of the healthcare technology names. We've talked about manufacturing. You've talked about agriculture. It's got some semiconductor exposure from a, a sensing and actuation perspective. So it's got some tech play in there, as I mentioned. Doesn't not always the case. You know that, as I said, it's, this is not a pure tech play, but it's got exposure to that. But one thing that's really important is the crossover. So the actual portfolio, as at the end of April, the crossover to, say, the S&P 500 is less than 3.5%. The crossover to the MISCI world or MSCI world, which is basically the global index that we refer to when we look at um, global markets, is less than 3%. So if you have exposure to a broad index or you have exposure to some active management or even some of the biggest mega cap direct stocks such as Amazon, Facebook, it's very unlikely that they're going to have an overlap with this as well, which is why we generally are seeing it used within portfolios by financial professionals, by clients because of that limited overlap. It gives them a really pure play theme. And you know, to peers in the market, there are other funds and other products that look at this particular area. We've taken the approach to partner with Robo Global, so that that purity play. You know, we really want the portfolio to be true to label when we're looking at thematics. Mm. Yeah, I think it's really good. I think it's um, yeah. I, I, my my numbers, which at the date of recording, I believe are accurate, are forty seven percent exposure to USA, seven percent Germany, nineteen percent to Japan, and um, and the list goes on from there. Which is which is great because a lot of people, um, regardless of whether you're an active or purely passive or half and half type person don't have exposure to Japan directly 
um, or parts of Europe, you know, specifically. So, yeah, it's a really interesting one, mate. Um, I'm glad that we did this kind of deep dive into robotics and in, into the ETF in general. So, and, and and also importantly, you touched on it using it as a TAA, like tactical asset allocation, potentially, you know, as a difference, a point of difference in your portfolio, or you know, even as that kind of core exposure to the long term trend that we're seeing in this market. Two hundred twenty over two hundred twenty million dollars invested in the the fund so far, which is no small feat. So obviously advisors are kind of getting behind it, which is kind of cool. All right, mate, Kanish, thanks for taking the time to join me on the show today. Cheers. Thanks, Owen. Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF or ASX JEPI, J-E-P-I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion as at the 16th of May, 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.